I'll read the first and the unnumbered verses, and we ask you to join together as you read the even. Shall we stand as we read the Word of God? This psalm is entitled to the chief musician upon Ayelas Shakar, which means the doe of the morning, or the hind, the deer of the morning, uh, probably was a tune that he's written the psalm to be sung to this tune of the doe of the morning. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee, and they were not confounded. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. But be not thou far from me, O Lord, O my strength, haste thee to help me. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorn. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. All ye the seed of Jacob, glorify him. And fear him, all ye the seed of Israel. My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear him. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all of the kindreds of the nation shall worship before thee. All they that be fat on the earth shall eat and worship, and all they that go down to the dust shall bow before him, and none can keep alive his own soul. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born, that he has done this. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for what you have done in sending your son to die that cruel and ignominious death on the cross, that we through his death might have life the forgiveness of sins. And Lord, we pray that this day your Holy Spirit will just unfold the Word of God to our hearts, that we might have understanding, Lord, 
of all that you are and of all that you have done in our behalf in redeeming us from the power of darkness and bringing us into your glorious kingdom. And so, Lord, let the word of God just minister to us today. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. You may be seated. Acts chapter 8, as we continue our journey through the Bible. We encourage you to read it over. Join with us tonight as we will be giving commentary on the 8th chapter of Acts. This morning we'd like to draw your attention to the 35th verse where we read, Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Philip was one of the seven men that had been chosen in the early church to wait on the tables to see that there was equity in the distribution of the church's welfare program to the widows. But when persecution came against the church, Philip was scattered with many of the believers throughout all of the area of Judea. Philip went up to Samaria, and there he began to preach Jesus Christ to the people and the power of the Holy Spirit was upon Philip. And there were a lot of people being healed, a lot of miracles that were being done in the name of Jesus through Philip so that multitudes of people believed on Jesus Christ. Of course, we remember that earlier in the life of Christ, he had gone to Samaria, met the woman by the well, and she went into town and brought a bunch of people out to hear Jesus, and they believed on him. They said, now we believe not because of what you told us, because we have heard for ourselves. So the seed had been planted there in Samaria, and Philip is going up and reaping a tremendous harvest of souls for Jesus Christ. When the church in Jerusalem heard of this great move of God in Samaria, they sent Peter and John to Samaria that they might lay hands on the people so that they can receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. For up to this time, they had not yet been empowered with the Spirit. Now, in the midst of this great move of God, one day the angel of the Lord said to Philip, I want you to go on down to the road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza to that desert area. Now the Lord didn't say what was going to happen, what he was going to do, just go on down to this road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. Now it wouldn't seem practical or reasonable that the Lord would take Philip out of this tremendous move of God where people are being saved and multitudes are believing and are baptized, that God would take him from the midst of this marvelous move of God down to a desert area. I'm certain that Philip in his own mind was wondering, why would the Lord want me to leave this place where so many people are accepting Jesus and go down to the desert? But Philip obeyed the Lord. And when he arrived down to the desert area, he saw a chariot that was heading south. And so the Lord said, Go join yourself to the chariot. Step two. But he didn't receive step two till he had taken step one. 
This is so often the case. The Lord leads us step by step. Now, we don't always appreciate that. I wish the Lord would lay out the whole picture. Lord, why do you want me to go to Gaza, that desert place? Well, when you get there, you're going to see this chariot. No, the Lord just gives you one step at a time because he wants you to walk by faith. He's always saying to us, just trust me. So Philip saw the chariot. The Lord said, join yourself to the chariot. So he went up to the chariot, and there was an Ethiopian. He was headed back to Ethiopia. He was a man of great authority in Ethiopia. He had come to Jerusalem to worship God, and he was on his way home, and he was reading the scriptures. He was reading from the scroll of Isaiah. Evidently, the man was searching for God. He had come all the way from Ethiopia to Jerusalem to find God, to worship God. Unfortunately, he was returning home as empty as he came. He was still searching. His quest for God was not satisfied in Jerusalem. By that time, the religious system in Jerusalem had become so commercialized and so corrupted that it would be difficult to find God in that kind of environment. There are many people today who are searching for God. And so often they search through the religions to find God. I saw a bumper sticker yesterday that said, God is so big he can't be confined to any one religion. Well, in reality, God can't be found in religion. You have to have a personal relationship with God, and this can only happen through Jesus Christ. There are many people today who go to church in a search for God. There's an awareness of an emptiness within their life, and they're seeking and searching for something more, and they go to church. And so often they go into a liberal, ritualistic kind of a meeting, and they don't find God, and they go away still empty, but I do believe that God is faithful and that God will reveal himself to every searching heart. And though this man had come all the way from Ethiopia to Jerusalem to find God and had failed to find God in Jerusalem, still searching for God, God saw the search of his heart and took Philip from this marvelous revival, this move of God in Samaria, and took him all the way down to this area of Gaza in order that this man might find God. God will meet every honest, searching heart. So as Philip came up to the chariot, he saw the fellow reading the scroll of Isaiah. And he asked, do you understand what you're reading? And the man said, how can I accept someone guide me? Many times people in their search for God pick up the Bible and start to read the Bible, but it just is confusion. It doesn't make sense. They need someone to guide them. The Bible says that the natural man does not understand the things of the Spirit, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. The Bible speaks concerning Lydia, that the Lord opened up her heart to the Scriptures.
Philip began at that scripture we read, and he began to preach to him Jesus. The man was reading that portion of Isaiah that declared, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter. As a lamb is dumb before his shears, he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life was taken from the earth. And the Ethiopian asked Philip, who was the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? And Philip began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Jesus is the key to the understanding of scriptures. You cannot understand the scriptures apart from the key. You must find Jesus. The Bible says that the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. Philip began at that verse and preached unto him Jesus. Now it didn't matter where he was reading in the Old Testament. You could start at any verse in the Old Testament and preach Jesus. It doesn't matter where he was reading. To understand the Old Testament, you need Jesus as the key to understanding. For he said to the Pharisees, you do search the scriptures because in them you think that they have life. But they are actually testifying of me but you won't come to me that you might have life. You see, the scriptures apart from Jesus are dead. Paul speaks about how that the letter killeth, but the Spirit gives life. Why? Because the Spirit gives you the understanding and the key to the scriptures, which is Jesus. And so Philip began to unfold the scripture to this man as he preached unto him Jesus. When Jesus was with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus after his resurrection from the dead, it says that Jesus began at Moses and went through all the prophets concerning the things that the scriptures had said about him. In the meeting with the rest of the disciples that same evening, Jesus said, These are the words which I spoke unto you while I was still with you, that all of the things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. You see, when we read the psalm this morning, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That psalm was about Jesus. They pierced his hands and his feet. They shook their heads saying he trusted in God to save him. Let him save him if he will have him. They parted my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Those things were all written about Jesus there in the Psalms, in the prophets, in Moses. It's all written about him. He said, I have come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. When Philip met Jesus, he came to his friend Nathanael sitting under a fig tree, and he said to Nathanael, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write. It is Jesus of Nazareth. So the recognition that Jesus was the message of the scriptures in the Old Testament. He is the key to the understanding of the Old Testament. Philip began at that scripture and preached unto him Jesus. 
Of Jesus it was written, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter. Now in the Old Testament, when a person would sin, they would take a lamb out of their flock and they would bring it to the priest and they would put their hands on the head of that lamb and they would confess their sins and in so doing were transferring the sin onto the lamb. Now the Bible said that the soul that sinneth shall surely die. So in that the sin was transferred onto the lamb, the lamb was then slain as a substitute for the person who had brought the lamb. Thus there was the death that resulted from their sin, the lamb being the substitute for them. Now Peter said we are redeemed not with corruptible things like silver or gold from the vain, empty lives that we used to live, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ who was slain as a lamb without spot or blemish. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter that he might bear our sins and die in our place. For all of us like sheep had gone astray. We turned every one of us to our own way, but God laid on him the iniquities of us all. That's just a little bit further down in the reading that the Ethiopian was reading out of Isaiah there. And then he went on to say, as the sheep before the shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Now we read that when Jesus was brought before Pilate, the Roman judge, that the Jews were making all kinds of radical and false accusations against Jesus. They were saying all of these just weird, unreasonable things, and Pilate recognized that. But Jesus didn't answer their charges. He didn't say, that's not true, that's not true. He just was silent. So much so that Pilate marveled that Jesus wasn't speaking up in defense of himself. As a lamb before her shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. I don't think that we can grasp the humiliation that Jesus experienced at the hands of men. Here he is, the only begotten Son of God. As Paul said to the Philippians, he was in the form of God and thought it not robbery to be equal with God, and yet he emptied himself, came in the form of a man. As a servant, he was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. But here he is, the Son of God, now being mocked, jeered, scoffed, People yelling at him, shaking their heads. The humiliation. The Bible tells us who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, though he despised that humiliation, the shame. Extremely humiliating. And in his humiliation, the prophet said his judgment was taken away. That is, there was absolutely no justice. They were demanding the death of an innocent man. That's not just. His judgment was taken away. Judas Iscariot brought back the 30 pieces of silver that he was given 
to betray Jesus. And he said to the priest, take this back. I have betrayed innocent blood. His testimony to the innocence of Jesus. Pilate said to the people, I have examined this man and I find no fault in him. Pilate's testimony, there's no fault in this man. Pilate had received a note from his wife that said, have nothing to do with this just man. Finally on the cross, the one thief said, this man has done nothing amiss. This is a horrible miscarriage of justice in his humiliation. The judgment was taken away. No justice at all in the death of Jesus Christ. It was one of the greatest sins of man. And then the prophet declared his life was taken from the earth. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Yet Jesus did no sin, but God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. God put upon him the iniquities of us all. And as God said in Isaiah 53, for the transgressions of my people was he smitten. The glorious results of preaching Jesus is that as they came to a body of water, the Ethiopian said to Philip, look, here's some water. Why can't I be baptized? And Philip said, well, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, you can. And the man responded, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you, you may. And he said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You see, the preaching of Jesus leads to faith in Jesus. The Bible says that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And it was through the prophecy of Isaiah and through seeing Jesus in the prophecy, this man came to a living faith in Jesus Christ. Philip didn't say, well, now if you will take the confirmation classes and if you will, uh, you know, sign all of these documents and all, uh, you know, then uh, we'll put your name up for vote and see if they will, uh, elders will, you know, allow it. No, no, no. None of that rigmarole just if you will believe with all your heart, you may. The Word of God, rightly understood and rightly preached, will bring men to a living faith in Jesus Christ. Paul said to the Corinthians, we preach not ourselves. God help us. But we preach Jesus Christ as the Lord and ourselves as servants for your sake. I pray that from this pulpit that will always be so. We will never preach ourselves, but we will preach Jesus Christ. For the scripture is of him. And may we always open the scriptures and bring Jesus to you out of the scriptures. Many times people use the Bible to preach many things. Many times they will quote the Bible to try to prove many points. But the heart of the message of the Bible is Jesus Christ, and it was written to bring to you the saving faith in Jesus Christ that you, like the Ethiopian, might be able to say, I believe 
that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. May we, like Philip, be able to take and from any verse preach Jesus, giving to people the key to the understanding of the Bible. Father, we thank you this day for the message of the Bible, the message of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, sent to this earth, to die a humiliating death, that through his death he might redeem man from the power of darkness and bring him hope and bring him life and bring him a relationship to God. Thank you, Father, for the truth that set us free. Bless now, Lord, the preaching of Jesus. In his name we ask it. Amen. Shall we stand? You see, as you see Jesus in the scriptures, it always then forces you to a decision, either to believe the Scriptures or not to believe. To believe in Jesus Christ is to have eternal life. Not to believe is not to have life, but worse than that, to have the wrath of God abiding on you. Your decision. The same scripture that brought conviction to the heart of that Ethiopian, causing him to believe that Jesus indeed is the Son of God, because he saw how that Jesus fulfilled these words of the prophet who wrote these things 700 years before Jesus ever suffered and died, he saw how that Jesus fulfilled them. He was convinced. God opened his heart to the truth. He saw the key, that which was confusing and that which he did not understand. Now as he sees the place of Jesus in it, he understands and he believes in Jesus. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will open up your heart that you might believe in Jesus also. I would encourage you if this day the Spirit of God is speaking to your heart, concerning your relationship with God. Maybe you've been searching for God and have sort of come up empty. I'd encourage you, go back to the prayer room. You'll never find God in religion, but you will find him in a personal relationship that is possible through Jesus Christ. May the Lord be with you, watch over and keep you in his love. May you have a fabulous week as you walk with Jesus. The Lord bless thee, and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee, and be gracious unto thee, and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up, the Lord lift up his countenance, his countenance upon thee. On behalf of the Word for Today, the broadcast ministry of Pastor Chuck Smith, we thank you for joining us in today's broadcast. For more of Pastor Chuck's studies and biblical teaching resources, visit our website at pastorchuck.org. You can contact the Word for Today at the Word for Today, P.O. Box 890-820, Temecula, California, 92589 or email us at infopastorchuck at gmail.com. 
We'll return with more of our verse-by-verse Bible study in our next broadcast with Pastor Chuck.